Welcome to Creative Mornings Oakland. I'm your host, Yvonne Lima, and thank you for being here. I know it's a little early. It's a little foggy this morning, but uh, we got some good coffee here today, some muffins. Hope you're ready to go. As most of you know, our theme this month is freedom. I want to introduce to you our speaker today. She's a multidisciplinary artist around town doing amazing work. She is an activist. She's a nonprofit founder. She is a printmaker. She owns a, a studio down, down the road on Adeline. And she's creating a lot of art that focuses on our theme today, freedom. So I probably missed a few of the things that she, uh, she does, because she does a lot. But I want to let her tell it to you today. So please welcome Faviana Rodriguez. Hi, everyone. I'm really excited to be here. This is my hometown. This is where I was born. This is where I grew up. And I want to start a little bit about talking about my art and activism and what has shaped my experiences uh, in order for me to do the work I do. The work that I do is centered around freedom, justice, and equality. And I think that in order to advocate those things, we have to understand where we are today, what is the state of inequality, vast inequality that we're in, and how can artists in particular change that? I'll start uh, with my own personal history. These are my parents. My parents migrated to the United States in the 1970s. And really my story is like the story of so many others. There was some key moments in my lifetime that really uh, affected me to the point that I decided that it was gonna be my life's work to change this. And that was first uh, in 1984, Reagan, uh, one of the presidents who I think was, you know, one of the worst presidents of all time, you know, someone who was in denial that AIDS even existed, somebody who uh, gutted the National Endowment for the Arts, somebody that was leading war in Central America, and began the privatization of many of our social service sector. Reagan in 1984 uh, passed something called IRCA, where he legalized three million migrants. And that was the last time we had immigration reform. Now this is almost over a quarter of a century ago. Uh, and it was interesting because often today in the dialogue around immigration, we hear that it's a partisan issue, that the Democrats and the Republicans. But I remind people that it's been 25 years since we've had a change, a real change in immigration laws. And for me, you know, being in a migrant family and for my parents to be undocumented for so long, uh, these laws and the fact that the laws needed to change really impacted me. Uh, and today, when, when I look at you know, three million migrants had, had been legalized under Reagan, today the number of undocumented migrants is at 11.5 million. Uh, and not only that, but our communities are suffering at the rate of deportations of 1,000 a day. That means every day 1,000 mothers, fathers, workers, people that we know and love, our fellow artists, are being deported. Uh, and so early on in my life, I started understanding, wow, these laws actually really affect how we live our lives. And then when I was 16 years old, 1994, something else happened, which is that Clinton passed NAFTA. And NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, was the promise that said that there would be no more borders between Mexico, the U.S., and Canada, that now free, the free market could freely move and that this was the beginning of a new era. For me, this was interesting because this was 1994 in California, and that year something else happened, which is Governor Wilson here in California introduced one of the most anti-immigrant bills ever introduced at the state level. In fact, he, was, he ran his entire platform of saying that he was going to get rid of some of the filth that had invaded California. And you know what that meant. This was a code word for Latinos and for migrants. And what got us here? Well, interestingly, in the 90s, from between 84 and 94, the Latino population jumped. It went uh, from being about 19% to over 26%. And so what was happening is the cultural shift here in California was really freaking out politicians. It was freaking people out. And um, uh, at the time, Wilson ran a platform in which he said, uh, that he was going to get, that, that immigrants were responsible for the stench of urination, defecation, narcotics, savagery, and death. And these were the kinds, of, this was the kind of language happening in the mainstream media. And in fact, 
This kind of imagery where you saw repetitively images of people crossing the border or people in trunks or images like this, the normalization of the word illegal became commonplace. And this began to affect me and many others. There's something that I learned early on, it's called unconscious bias, which is that when you begin to see repeated images, whether that's uh, images of young black men who are deemed dangerous or images of immigrants who are somehow deemed as a threat, that little by little you begin to form these ideas. Interestingly, these guys are actually from LA. They're not even, <laughs> they're not migrants, but uh, we all got mixed up in, in this whole like cultural war against migrants. Uh, Latinos were all seen as the same. And so why do I share this? Well, also that year, 1994, while we had this promise of somehow uh, uh, this new market, that same year the U.S. border began to get militarized in San Diego and in El Paso. My understanding as a young person is that uh, policies were, were affecting our lives very drastically and that there was something that you could not see. And that the way of the power of art is that art could ultimately transform what you see. And this is what we saw. We saw the militarization of the border. Um, and what we did not see was the cost, the human toll that it would take for people to cross. And today we are at ne approaching the 5,000 death mark at the border. And as a creative person, I very much care about what you see and what you don't see, especially at a time uh, of inequity. And so on the metaphor of the border, for me, what I began to understand is that there are these binaries that exist in the national conversation. And these binaries are illegal citizen, right? And that racism and patriarchy were the norm of the day. And that we were living in a culture that was normalizing racism, uh, that was really uh, 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 beginning to uh, uh, pit a cycle uh, of anti-immigrant thought. And remember, this was 1994. Ten years later, uh, we saw SB 1070 in, uh, in uh, Arizona. And what was the counter to that? Freedom, right? Liberation. And how is it that we could reach this through art and culture? Well, first, that art and culture allows us to see ourselves as multi-dimensional people. When I was growing up, this is one of my early pieces. When I was growing up, I remember rarely seeing representations of myself in positive ways. Uh, in fact, uh, whiteness was the norm. And in fact, today, whiteness continues to be the norm in what we define as beauty. And that is what is called institutionalized and internalized racism. And in this early piece, I wanted to kind of draw a juxtaposition uh, between the ideas that I had been educated with and even, you know, for those of you who grew up in Latino families, sometimes you're encouraged to mejorar la raza, right? What that means is that your family tells you, oh, you know what, you got to improve our race, so be sure to date a, a blanquito or date someone who is a little lighter skin than you because you have to work on improving our race. And so these kind of internalized messages were also, you know, I'm from, I'm from Peru. My family's from Peru, and yet we never talked about our blackness. We never talked about that slavery. The majority of slavery happened actually in South America, and many of us Latinos are also black, and yet we don't discuss uh, that we have blackness in us. In fact, I think we're more willing to align ourselves with the Spanish, our Spanish history than we are with our black history. And in this piece, I wanted to not just talk about the whiteness that I saw every day, but also even the whiteness in Catholicism. My family had come from Peru. They were very strong Catholics. And I remember being taken to church and hearing messages about virginity, right? That somehow if you were uh, engaging in, if you were having sex or if you were hanging out with boys, that you were, uh, uh, you were approaching the, the, the whore side, right? Because again, this this space of dichotomies where there was no in-between. And in this piece, I'm looking at the other side of my reflection, uh, and I'm being raw, I'm uncovering myself, decolonizing my mind, and embracing my blackness, and embracing my strength as a woman of color. And so art became a way for me to reclaim my humanity, and to really show myself as a full human being, because in mainstream media, people of color are depicted in very narrow ways. On the counter, when we see white actors and their stories, they are in very multi-dimensional ways. I mean, they have such complex lives. And yet, people of color are, are, are so underrepresented, and that creates something called unconscious bias, which means a bias against us that ultimately then 
streams into policy and before you know it you have anti-immigrant laws being the norm like you do today. This dichotomy here of the virgin, the horse slut dichotomy and this was something that really fascinated me because I would, you know, I, I had a, a weird encounter with, with one of the priests as I was growing up and I was like, you know, what you're talking about, this whole kind of uh, uh, who, what it means to be pure and, and this whiteness is, uh, is, you know, this is something I, I didn't want. On the contrary, I was really um, explorative as a young woman. Uh, I wanted to really understand uh, what it was like to be b with both men and women. And I was fascinated by the fact that when you talked about puberty, young men had wet dreams. And yet, when you learned about women's bodies, we just learned about our periods. Like, what is the equivalent to a wet dream for a young woman? I mean, really, w why didn't we learn about pleasure? Why did, the only way we learned about our bodies was through a health context. Uh, we did not learn how to go to sleep at night and fantasize and wake up to a really beautiful wet dream. That was not something that was normalized. What was normalized was discussions around avoiding pregnancy, this thing called your period, which would make you, uh, you know, in a, in a really negative state of mind. And I began to understand that uh, on the reason there's no conversation around that was because women's morality, we, we wanted to police young women's morality and we start very young. And so uh, the other side of that, of course, is that if you engage in any kind of sexual behavior, then you are a, a slut. Uh, when I was growing up watching novelas, which is these TV shows on Spanish language, it was unbelievable to me that these heroes were all these really well-behaved girls who never had sex and the girls who had sex and who were really hot and sexy were dangerous and they were all <laughs> they were always the ones who were the bad girls and so this is you know this is this is why I became an artist actually is because I said these are such limited narratives and What's crazy is we're watching these narratives for years after years and they inform the way that we engage with politics. Now it'd be one thing if these ideas just lived in our mind, but these ideas actually translate into real policy that affects our lives every day, in, day in and day out. This is a, an illustration of how it is that I, I approach art making in general because of course I was mad. I was a mad young woman. I would you know, be one of the only young women of color in my honors classes. Um, I would consistently see the way the police came onto campus and harassed the young men of color. And I lived through the beginning of the anti-migrant wave, which every year consistently got worse and worse. Um, and although I loved the space of art making, I also loved the space of politics. And I became involved with social justice at a very young age. So first is the space of action. And that is that we have to understand that laws govern the way we live our lives. The fact that young people today, the student debt rates they have, the fact that their student rates are higher than the banks that we bailed out, that's law and policy that's going to affect their ability to be full human beings for the rest of their lives. The fact that corporations are seen as people and that they will now influence the way elections are run, that's something that will affect all of us. It will affect us from the air we breathe to the water we drink to the quality of food to the fact that we can't see when there's GMOs in our, in our fruits and vegetables. And so do we care about the action space? Absolutely. We need to understand who are making these laws. Uh, we need to apply political pressure on them. And we have to understand that the action space is consistently a space of urgency, right? And this is that everyday conversations are being had. I mean, one of the big, um, you know, o Obama, uh, before he got elected, he had promised immigration reform. He had said many times that he was going to legalize the 11 million and he is now into his second term and nothing has happened. On the contrary, the wealth gap for black and Latino folks has increased under his administration. We have surveillance under his administration. We have a record breaking deportation rate under his administration. And then on the other side is the space of ideas. And that is that we need to not just be confined by politics and that we need to not just be defined by the oppressor's language, right? And that is that the oppressor teaches me that I'm a woman of color and therefore I'm over here, I'm a woman of color, I'm not white because whiteness is the center, right? And it also teaches me, for example, I am a woman. I'm, a, I'm in a fixed gender and that this is what women do and this is an identity that I can't get rid of. In the space of ideas is where we can radically change systems, and that is how do we completely re-envision our society? How do we envision a world uh, that's gender-free, where gender binaries don't exist? I think that often in the space of social justice, we're very limited by what we can win. 
Uh, let's remember who is in the majority of Congress, okay? The majority of Congress, first of all, is male. There's only about 18% women in Congress running your country, 18% uh, women, and yet women make up half of the population. The majority of them are white men. The majority of them are voting in policies that very much affect, directly affect in negative ways people of color. And so do we need to, we need to change entirely how people think. We can't be limited just to the wins that they will give us because their frame of mind is very narrow. Uh, and in the space of ideas as work, we can be visionary. Uh, we don't just need a fight for what we're against. We need to fight for the kind of society we want to build. And often in social justice, and especially when we're fighting for change, we're always in the no. We're saying uh, 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 no to jails. No, don't cut this. No, don't deport my family. But what are we saying yes to? We need to think uh, uh, about the kind of world we need to build. And this is why I think as artists, we need to be able to go in both places, play in both spaces. Because we also, uh, in, the art, in the art world, often we're, we're encouraged just to think in the space of ideas. And if you play with politics, then somehow your art is seen as less than. But uh, the case that I would like to make is that we have to play in both because the times are very urgent and we as artists are not disconnected from our community. In fact, we're very much shaped. And just a little bit of context of where we are today. Today, United States schools are more segregated than they've been in four decades. And over the past 30 years, incarceration rates have gone up 400%. So we are at a time of vast racial inequality. Uh, although we, it's, it's 2014, it's been 40 years since Roe versus Wade, there's been over 200 laws passed restricting women's right to abortion. So do we need to get loud? Do we need to be mad? Absolutely, and we need to engage. And um, often, you know, people say, well, what can art do, right? Why does art matter? Why does culture matter? Well, culture is fundamentally about how we see the world. Uh, culture shapes our ideas. Uh, culture shapes how we identify in community, and culture is where we can attach emotions to real change, and it's where we win enthusiasm for our values. And art and culture is where we can change the narrative, because as artists, we can present another kind of narrative. We can present narratives about self-love, about equity, right? Um, culture and art make change not just possible, but inevitable. And so when we, begin to, when we begin to understand this, then we begin to see that the role of artists is actually indispensable in changing culture. Because be cha before you change politics, you have to change culture. And uh, the people who most taught us this actually are the anti-migrants. I mean, the anti-migrants began putting out these ideas over and over again. And before you knew it, state by state by state began adopting anti-immigrant laws to the point now where uh, criminalizing of migrants is the norm. They have, they have pushed so much on the cultural front that they made it the norm. Similarly, in 1997, Ellen DeGeneres comes out, right? I was a teenager at the time. You probably remember this, but <laughs> today, if Ellen DeGeneres comes out, it's like, yeah, whatever. I mean, yeah, everyone else is coming out. But she was the first one to come out on national television. And if you remember at the time how big, how big of a deal this was, uh, and, and it was interesting because there was this moment where people who were watching Ellen DeGeneres on TV could really connect with her in, their, in the privacy of their living room. And this was not about saying, hey, uh, here's my 10-point platform on why marriage equity is something you need to consider. This was an emotional moment because Ellen was funny and you were engaging with a really powerful story. Uh, and little by little, minds began to shift. Next, you had people like Rachel Maddow. Then you had Macklemore create the video of Same Love. And today we have sports, people in sports coming out. This is what a cultural shift looks like, is that from 1997, we go from this cover to this cover in 2013. And that cover says, um, uh, the Supreme Court hasn't made up its mind, but America has. 1997 to 2013, you see an, a culture shift around marriage equity. And that means that people normalized. They began to see normal marriage uh, between two people who loved each other. Now, of course, there's a lot of uh, racial justice uh, that needs to happen in this world because that is definitely not a representation, a fair representation. 
But I just want to make this case because ideas do shift. And we need to take this on seriously when, when we look at the stories of Trayvon Martin and Justin Davis and understand that we are in a normalized state where the lives of black, young black men do not matter. We are in a normalized culture where every day 1,000 migrants are being deported, many of them for non-criminal offenses, the majority of them for a broken taillight, and many of these are moms and children, and mothers are being separated, and that's normalized. This is where we have to say, how do we shift the narrative? How do we show a humane face, right? And that Ellen was about talking about her humanity. And even then, Ellen was not able to do this uh, were it not for the work of GLAD. Because you know that the AP used to use the word homosexual, and GLAD came in and said, you know, in the 80s, they said, you know what, we don't want you using that word, because that word sounds very clinical. We want you to use gay. And they won. And this is exactly the same thing why we fight for to not use the word illegal. Because when you say the word illegal, you think a certain way. And we instead say no. Use the word documented. Because that entirely puts us in a, in, in a much better place to begin a conversation. When you say the word illegal, you are starting at a place of criminality. And uh, if you poll American voters, you know their number one thing? Law and order. Americans just love their law and order. They love laws. And so you can't, when you start, at a place of criminality, then you're already, cre you're already shaping the narrative. In, in 2010, I began to see how undocumented youth in particular began to completely change the narrative. Now remember, 94, the word illegal began to get normalized. Uh, 16 years later, 2010, young, uh, uh, young people, young undocumented folks, decided that they did no longer wanted to wait for the DC nonprofits to do something, and they began to come out with their stories, and they began to say, I'm undocumented, and I'm afraid to say so. Very similar to the teachings of Harvey Milk, who said, we need to come out. We need to say that we're gay, because if we stay in the shadows, then we are uh, allowing other people to make decisions for us, and we're allowing other people to define our stories. And this was huge. Because previous to that, I don't know if you remember the, the marches in 2006 where millions of migrants were marching. In fact, they were one of the largest marches in U.S. history in 2006. But um, the conversation was, was still about, we're good migrants. We're here to work for you, America. We're, we're, we belong here. We're not criminals. We're not like those uh, uh, Arab migrants who are going to destroy your, your, uh, your country. We are good migrants. And so it created this kind of good, bad migrant narrative. But young people stood up and said, no, we are unafraid to tell you that we are undocumented and we're going to begin to come out. And we're, you are going to realize that the people who you are calling illegal are students, they're your neighbors, they're people who work with you, and that we are full human beings. And it changed the conversation so much. Within two years, uh, President Obama passed DACA and he passed the Deferred Action um, Deferred action for alien minors, which was not legalization, but it was relief from deportation and a work permit. And so if you have any doubt that pushing the narrative can actually change policy, then this is a great example that it can. That when we really push the narratives and we come out with our stories, we can change policies. Uh, I was so inspired by that that I created a campaign called Migration is Beautiful because I realized that we were so inundated with messages of criminality that we would forget the very basic thing, which that, you know what? Our parents' migrant story is a beautiful thing. You know what it means to cross the border and leave your home and be on top of a train for 57 days and risk rape and risk narcos uh, assaulting you because you are in search of something much bigger? That is what migrants do. And rather than treat them like they've committed a crime, we should understand that they are doing the thing that, that humans do best, which is survive. And that they are the sign of ultimate resistance and desire to complete a goal. Uh, and in fact, we should be building uh, 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 monuments or at least thanking, showing some gratitude to migrants which make it so that Americans can eat so cheap. You know, and so I wanted to celebrate that, you know what, when we talk about criminals, you're talking about my parents, and were not for my mother migrating here, I would not be able to be an artist. I would not have had the opportunities that I had. And so, also, migration is in our DNA. You know that we've been moving since the beginning of time. 
Our people moved from Africa. Our people moved from all over. And yet, when white folks move, it's seen as like a good thing, as they're settling new frontiers. But when people of color move, it's a criminal act. And I wanted to remind folks that migration is a natural phenomenon. And you know, the monarchs, the monarch butterflies, they naturally migrate. The monarch butterflies fly from Mexico through the United States and Canada and back. And when we think of butterflies, we think beautiful things. But when we think of migrants, we think illegals, criminalities, they're breaking the law. So how do we transform that and really think about the positive and the beautiful, the resilience that it takes for people to migrate and understand that migration means a failure of the nation state to serve its people? Because you know what? Migration, it shot up after NAFTA. Okay, and not just that, if Americans could migrate, and they are, they would, because NAFTA created such a deplorable conditions for workers here. Uh, the, the meme has been adopted in many places. I mean, I put out art kits, I do, you know, t-shirts, uh, activities, um, and, and it's really been a moment for us to uh, celebrate and be proud of who we are while fighting these laws that are destroying our community. I even took it to Burning Man. It was really interesting because you know, in Burning Man, we're in the desert, and you have to remind people, you know that people are crossing the desert every single day, uh, and that uh, our, we are aligned, because at, at Burning Man, many of the values are around resiliency and, and, and uh, respect for autonomy. And just really, you know, trying to take this image and this concept of the butterfly to as many places as possible. In Philadelphia, a group of mothers cut out the butterflies, and they pasted it onto the building of ice immigration and customs enforcement. And this was a powerful moment because then what they did is they took this very dangerous place and covered it with love as a way of saying we're no longer afraid of you. And finally, I'm gonna wrap it up uh, with, with the work I do around women. And, and uh, you know, patriarchy is something that often we talk about we're in the age of women's equality. Uh, that's, at the global level, that's not true. Uh, you, you don't have to look too far, you just have to look at Congress to understand that women's equity is still uh, in a much desired state. And uh, not only that, but if you look at the number of laws that have been passed against uh, women's reproductive justice, you will feel like we're 50 years back. Um, and, and, and not just that, but we still don't have mandatory paid maternity leave, although women do uh, a big chunk of childcare and housework. Uh, we are still uh, very much falling behind on the wage gap, and since 2011, 200 abortion restrictions have been passed. Uh, and you have the predominance of rape culture, right, which is this culture of non-consent, and you see it over and over in mainstream media. And especially in 2012, when you began to just see the rise of, uh, of laws restricting a woman's right to abortion, that's for me when something really changed. And that's when I began to take on slut phobia, right, and that is that uh, there is, as you remember from the, the, the binary, that uh, I, I had never really taken it on, but I was like, you know, what is this word slut? And why is it that we uh, uh, allow for slut phobia to happen at such uh, a, a normalized national level? I mean, you know that the number even of, of suicides that young girls commit because they're slut shamed is a, is a big indicator of of how women are viewed in society, because when you have something called slut shaming, it means we're buying into this binary that sluts even exist. What is a slut? I mean, really, what is it? It's a magical equation, or at what point does a young woman become, become a slut? At what po point does she join that club? Um, uh, and really, at the bottom line of this is that women's sexuality has to be policed. It's, this is an issue of morality that comes into play. And as a woman that's about freedom and liberation, I was like, nobody needs to police me. In fact, um, we need to get rid of these uh, assumptions around the fact that women are somehow, uh, that we need to behave in certain ways. And really, we need to remind people that they need to stop telling me what to do with my pussy, <laughs> fundamentally. Um, <clears throat> And, and, and also that, again, going back to the space of ideas and culture, you know what? What are you going to tell these old conservative guys who are designing laws? You're going to tell them, please give me back my right to my birth control and my insurance plan? No. 
they're it, it, moving them on policy, moving them on a conversation that they're not even prepared to have, I think is not the right space of our energy. I think on the contrary, I was like, let's get into some pussy power. Because you know what? Rape culture is over here. And what's going to counter rape culture? What is going to bring us over to the other side? Because how many young women, first of all, are learning about pleasure? And second, how many young women even are looking at their vaginas? We don't even look at our vaginas. It's a culture that doesn't encourage us to explore, to even see what it looks like. If you ask young people to draw sexual organs, you know that they can draw a penis very easily. They don't even know what a vagina looks like. And if you, it, it, there's a survey that just came out about young women. You know that young women are having much more sex. They're having sex much earlier, and they're not enjoying it. If you ask them if they're liking it, they're not enjoying it. And what does that say, that even in this age of supposed women's liberation, that we haven't taught our young women about pleasure? And you know, it's funny, because I talk to parents all the time, and I tell them, you need to talk to your daughter about masturbation and about vibrators. And they're like, oh, I'm not going to do that. I was like, well, then you know where she's going to learn it? From the internet, from porn. And that's going to set the standard of what sex is and how she should enjoy it and how she should have agency. Because this fundamentally is about agency and it's about our humanity. When we continuously see ourselves in objectified ways, then uh, we are limiting who we can fully be. This is piece is one of my final pieces. I'm going to begin to wrap it up. And also just rethinking relationships overall. I mean, I was always, as a young woman, I would watch these novelas. I was like, God, this is so cheesy. It's like this woman, her only desire is to find her prince charming and to live with him forever on. I don't want to do that. I want to, like, fuck shit up in the world. And where are those models? Where are those stories? Everything. And just look at, main, look at go look at your favorite films. What do, you know what the women actors desire in those films? Their ultimate goal is to get booed up. I'm serious. It's like, come on. Can you write some new films, guys? Can you do something more creative? Uh, and, and in this piece, I also want to challenge relationships. I want to challenge uh, our ideas that we have about sex. Um, and finally, uh, um, I'll end with this piece, which is uh, the, the piece around there is no shame in having an abortion. I had an abortion when I was 19 years old. I share that with you because one in three women in the United States has an abortion, and yet there's a culture of stigma and silence. And this is what I mean about the action space. Uh, we are not speaking out. And you know, by not speaking out, we're in the closet. And guess what? Guess what happens when you're in the closet with your stories? Then you have the onslaught of laws, and you have, you have people speaking on your behalf. And before you know it, the policy's there. And before you know it, the majority of the country is there. And so I encourage people to come out, to break the silence, and, and use art, use storytelling to really create another kind of narrative and to challenge, uh, to challenge uh, the power. This is something that was inspired by young people coming out with their stories of being undocumented. If one in three women are having abortions, that means the wives, girlfriends, lovers of all these conservative guys who are passing these laws have also had an abortion. Uh, so I'll close it out with that. This final piece uh, is called My Vagina, My Orgasms, and My Imagination because I really do want everyone to have really good orgasms. I want women to have good orgasms especially because you know what? That is part, that, that, that is part of changing the conversation. The dominant conversation in porn is not about us having orgasms, but by us, pussy power, orgasms, I think we can really change the world. Thank you so much.